All right, let's turn to border security. Enough about that gut as gateway to cardiovascular disease. Let's look at uh, this immune system that we've been hearing so much about. We are a composite organism. I think uh, we were convinced of that today, that bacteria are with us and they matter. We're one-third solids, two-thirds water. There are a hundred times more bacterial cells than human cells in our composite body. And the DNA that we have in our cells is about 25,000 genes, um, and we need 100 times that amount at least in order to run the body. And it turns out that the bacteria that are with us and have grown up with us have actually taken over a lot of the functions. And we even learned that, the, uh, that bacteria can learn to reside in the body in various organs and actually function as a, as a miniature organ uh, in, inside our cells. So it's a, it's a win-win situation. Now, this is a complex diagram, but all I want you to do is look at the bottom of the slide and all those little boxes with words after them. Those all are family groups of bacteria. And the circles above them, you can read in the upper left it says nostril, and in the lower right circle it says knee crease. And at the top, in the middle, it says hair. And coming down the left side, second row, near the bottom, gut. There are bacteria everywhere on the human body and research is going rampant now to figure out what they're doing and what disturbs them and what nourishes them. So this is studying the microbiome. So in the GI tract, we're now moving down to the small intestine in orange and its job, as you learned earlier today, is to absorb everything and sort it out later. So there's a blood vessel that runs from the small intestine to the liver called the portal vein. It really acts like an artery because uh, it's really carrying good, good stuff, but it's carrying all our drugs, uh, all our food, all the stuff, the bacteria, things that we've absorbed that, that, uh, that just get in. And then the liver acts as the central intelligence agency and it may refer things to the spleen, it may send things to the lymph node for destruction, or it may excrete things out in the bile just to get rid of them, to dump them. But the small intestine is uh, not real selective. Its job is to absorb everything. But in the colon, as we learned uh, uh, from uh, David Montgomery, uh, its job is to uh, ferment the waste, to recycle water, and not recycle waste. Remember in high school biology class, we learned about a membrane that would allow solute to diffuse of one kind and not another, or it would allow water to diffuse and not the solute, whatever was dissolved in it. That was a semi-permeable membrane. Well, the colon is lined by one layer of cells, the enterocyte, which is a semi-permeable membrane. And here you see the bacteria at the top layer, all different kinds of bacteria, and then you see the cell, one cell layer. And remember that little blue spider-like cell, the dendritic cell he talked about? So it can grab a sample from the lumen and pull it down and analyze it and present it to the immune system for action. So this is a very complex system, but bacteria play a very important role. And uh, the discussion we're about to have now, uh, I would tell you, uh, there's a book out there I saw on the tables that's called Rethink Food. Anybody see that book? Well, it's out there. And I have a little chapter in that on uh, what we're going to talk about right now. Uh, bacteria living in the GI tract, the good ones, require fiber as their food. Remember that? We learned that this morning. And when they digest fiber, they release butyric acid or butyrate. And that is the fuel, like most cells need glucose, these enterocytes that line the make the semipermeable membrane of the colon, they require butyrate as a fuel if they are to maintain tight junctions between the cells. You see the little black dots between the cells? Those are tight junctions, some actually physical junction and some electrochemical gradient junction, like the two ends of the magnet that don't, won't meet. Well, the two ends of the magnet that do meet uh, help create that tight junction. It's maintained by cell activity that requires butyrate as fuel. So in order to have a, a, a lining that is not permeable to foreign material, you have to have food for the good bacteria.
So that is the story in a nutshell because you know that the immune system lines the GI tract. 70 to 80% of our immune system cells line the GI tract, protecting our borders from invasion as the world passes through us. You see the child crawling around on the floor? Everything, everything they find. First, they taste it. Even things they find on the dog they want to taste because they're instructing their immune system what to be tolerant of. Their immune system has to learn what to tolerate and what not. So, here we see this uh, one cell layer in more detail, and I'm just showing you what you already heard today. Right in the middle, from microbes coming down, it says SCFA, short-chain fatty acids, butyrate. That goes to the cells and that helps the cells be tight and not allow things to get through that will excite the immune system and set it off. Now, if we grow a new lining of our colon every 12 days, cells are sloughing off. They're disappearing into, uh, into the milieu in the intestinal tract, and new cells are growing up and taking their place. What if there was no fiber and no bacteria and no butyrate, which happens when we don't eat right and take antibiotics and, and so on, then you could leak a part of a colon lining cell through and come in contact with the T cells and B cells that line the GI tract, and they could recognize that as foreign because it is something they should never have seen. And if they make antibodies to that cell, then those antibodies sca scavenger around the body looking for some colon lining cells to attack as foreign. And if you get an antigen antibody complex from one of these foreign particles, it could be food particle, it could be bacterial particle, it could be cell particle, it could be a chemical particle. And if you get an antibody antigen complex that gets carried around the body, it could set off a reaction in the nervous system like multiple sclerosis or in the connective tissue like lupus. So, we're now realizing that the immune system can do friendly fire against different parts of the body based on the look-alike of whatever it's picked up on. So, we want to keep the cell uh, membranes tight and we want to have the immune system calm. On the lower left-hand corner, it says pro-inflammatory pro reactions. On the right-hand lower corner, anti-inflammatory reactions. And that's what we, in working with our gastrointestinal tract, are in charge of, but we didn't know it, and we didn't know how to do it. Now, the best book that I have found to explain this came out in 2013. I mean, this is new stuff. And it's by Susan Blum, and it's called Immune System Recovery Plan. And she has three chapters on what to do to get your gut healthy again, which is treating the root cause of so many of our chronic diseases, if not the whole thing, at least an important aspect of it. So here again, bacteria regulated by the immune system, and here we have immune response to the resident bacteria. So it, it works both ways because everything is a systems biology approach. It's complex and interrelated. And I think we learned enough about that. Now, I took care of patients with Crohn's disease. And by the way, it's spelled C-R-O-H-N. Uh, you have to move the H from where you'd want to put it to where it belongs at the end of the word. Crohn's disease after Dr. Crohn. And this is an autoimmune inflammation of the GI tract because these things we just talked about are out of sync. So I would have my patients on an anti-inflammatory diet on an omega-3 fatty acid supplement, either from fish oil or flax oil, walnuts and almonds, or sea algae, the DNA, the, the and I've lost it, the, the component of, of omega-3s that we need the most is in, also in sea algae, which are actually plants. And I would have them get their vitamin D level up and get, because that regulates the immune system and have them use an anti-inflammatory herb like curcumin, and uh, along with the traditional medications. And as their uh, whole system improved, they would have less flares and less flares and less flares. And so what we have is not a battle between alternative medicine and conventional medicine, but begin to do our part 
I cannot go home with these people and give them their medicine. I can't cook their breakfast or supper for them. They must do it themselves. So as you begin to take this on, you're not going against what your doctor's doing. You're just making it less and less necessary. And that actually then is a smooth transition if the physician is uh, res responsible to be a part of tapering the medications as they're no longer needed. So here is an example uh, of care of Crohn's disease with a complementary uh, medicine. Nutritionfacts.org is the website. We know plant-based diets decrease markers of inflammation, but to see if plant-based diets decrease inflammation in a clinically relevant way, you've got to put it to the test. The gold standard for evidence in nutritional science is an interventional trial. You split people up into two groups, put half on one diet, half on the other, see what happens. Inflammatory bowel diseases, such as Crohn's disease, is an autoimmune condition where your immune system attacks your own intestines. Uh, there's no cure. All you can do is try to keep it in remission as long as possible between attacks. Sufferers are often put on anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive drugs and may find themselves in and out of the hospital getting segments of their intestines surgically removed. Since it's the intestine itself that's inflamed, uh, that would seem to be a good condition to test out the anti-inflammatory power of plant-based diets. Uh, we've known that you know, meat, cheese, um, fish, animal protein in general has been found to increase risk of developing inflammatory bowel disease. But what about plants to not just prevent but treat it. Japanese researchers took a group of Crohn's patients in remission, either because they just came out of surgery, uh, or they were able to beat it back with steroids, and for two years asked half of them to eat a semi-vegetarian diet, meaning in this case vegetarian, except for half a serving of fish a week and a half a serving of other meat once every two weeks. But otherwise, they were supposed to eat vegetarian, less than one serving of meat per week. Now, this wasn't a prison study or anything. They were free-living adults. So the results are not necessarily what happens when Crohn's sufferers actually go on a plant-based diet, but what happens when people are just told to eat a plant-based diet, um, and, uh, and how much they comply is up to them, which makes the results even more astounding. Check this out. The dashed line is the standard diet group. The solid line is the semi-veg. 200 days into the study, all the patients told to eat more of a plant-based diet are still in remission, but about 20% of the group not told to eat anything different relapsed. After a year, 100% of the semi-veg group still symptom-free, but the disease re-emerged in half of the standard diet group. And at the end of two years, 92% of the patients told to eat a more plant-based diet remained without disease, whereas the majority of those not given that advice relapsed back into cycles of drugs, hospitalizations, and surgery. A highly significant finding. And that horrible relapse rate is typical on typical diets. Most Crohn's sufferers relapse within a year or two, yet the semi-vegetarian diet was highly effective in preventing relapse in Crohn's disease. Uh, remission rate, meaning disease-free status, with the semi-vegetarian diet was 100% at one year and 92% at two years. This is the best result in relapse prevention. To the best of the researcher's knowledge, this is the best result in relapse prevention ever reported. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, a shout out. A shout out to Dr. Michael Grieger. He reads 8,000 articles a year. Those that are ready for prime time, uh, th this is just a nutrition science. He puts into a three minute video referenced for scholars and in the language of the lay public, and it's all free at nutritionfacts.org. And you can sign up for the daily video, or you can go to the left hand side of the website and by alphabet, clicking on the alphabet, if you want to look up proteins, you can click on P. If you want to look up cancer, click on C. And there's 1,800 videos that you can review.
Michael Grieger, but it's nutritionfacts.org. So we have the same story here at the top of the picture there. You see the burger and the antibiotics and infections. And at the bottom, you see colon cancer. So it's not within the range of this talk to cover that topic. But remember that Dean Ornish was reversing prostate cancer uh, with the same uh, program. So it's no surprise. Uh, if we look at the fiber content of foods, uh, we're really looking at uh, we're really looking at phytochemicals, aren't we? We learned that. And if you look at the left-hand side, foods contain various amounts of fiber or phytonutrients, and the animal foods on the right, zero. How do you know if you're getting enough fiber? If you don't know how to calculate 35 grams or more a day, just wait until you look in the mirror and you look like this. That's enough fiber. And uh, here we are with a summary. Of, this comes out of our classes for fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Uh, they keep a diary and they try and record the number of colors they've eaten in their foods, what foods have that color, and what uh, active substances are in those foods. And so uh, this list of rules on the left-hand side is what uh, we already know. Uh, we need to have an anti uh, our diet to be anti-inflammatory, anticoagulant, uh, not viscous, but, but uh, dilute, antioxidant and antacid or alkaline, and plant foods do all of that for us. This stable environment in the GI tract's intestinal bacteria group is responsible for up-regulating, down-regulating inflammation. Inflammation is usually physiologic and controlled. On the left-hand side, we see that with normal physiology in the gut, the gut-brain axis is in balance. But if we get an unstable environment, altered bacteria, incremental increase in inflammation, we can get uh, an altered uh, mental status or brain function. It can work in reverse. Stress and altered brain function can change physiology in the gut such that it is hospitable to a different set of bacteria. So it works either way. So this integration of the uh, brain with the gut-brain axis uh, and the bacteria is very important, and you'll see much more research coming out about this, the role of the microbiome in affecting uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Just like Susan Blum has written a book about uh, healing immune system diseases, uh, there are books now starting to come out about, with an introduction to healing uh, neurodiseases. And of course, in the stress, uh, stress's effect on the body, we have two nervous systems, the sympathetic nervous system, which is represented on the left side of the screen, and on the right side is the parasympathetic nervous system. That's when we're relaxed and happy. And left is when we're on or up against it or, or, or uh, having difficulties. And just notice the effect on eyes and saliva and heart and lungs and stomach and liver in each nervous system, the effect is the exact opposite. See the pluses and minuses? So we need to develop skills that take us from living in our parasympathetic, on guard, ready for a fight nervous system to a more peaceful, uh, ready to negotiate and spend most of the day enjoying our lives kind of nervous system. And the Ornish program uh, teaches that as one of the four pillars of their intervention. And here's the Immune System Recovery Plan by Susan Blum. Uh, 